Dolores Umbridge, Winifred Sanderson, Mary Sanderson, Sarah Sanderson. What is with the Sandersons? Madame Mim. Even Witch Hazel. But I bet you've never heard of me. Angelique Bouchard. You can call me Angie. Well, maybe you can. What did I do? I asked a man to love me. Look at what he gets. I gave him a choice. Me or internal imprisonment in a coffin. He chose the coffin. So I put him in a box for 200 years. 196, let's not be dramatic. And then he escaped, but not for long. Hello, welcome back to the Spoony Stitcher channel. You're inside the spooky stitchery. I'm Shannon, the Spoony Stitcher. Welcome. This is Tim Burton Tuesday. Our film today is, if you haven't guessed yet, Dark Shadows, loosely based on the television show of the same name. Loosely. <laughs> so I have crocheted a bunch of different things to go with today. First, let's talk about what I'm wearing, shall we? I bought this dress years ago um, to wear for my masquerade birthday party. That never happened. I had surgery instead. Yay. Anyway, I bought it to be Odile from Swan Lake, the black swan. I have a mask and everything, and I might wear it this spooky season. We don't know. It's whatever I feel like. <laughs> but um, I also thought this dress was very Angie because it has the velvet details that you can kind of see with the sheer lining. It has this little moment up here near the neck, which one of her dresses does this. So very witchy. And um, it's, you know, it's blue, but it looks black. And so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and a lot of her outfits are blue, black, kind of hard to tell. And then, um, yes, I'm wearing makeup today and uh, we'll see how long it lasts because it is starting to bother me, but. What do you think? <laughs> so. Also, why am I standing? I hurt my sciatic nerve. Yeah. If you watched Sunday's video on my autumn podcast, you know all about that. But we're not here about me. We're here about the crochet. So what did I crochet for dark shadows? So first of all, dark shadows is about a vampire. So if you haven't seen my terror tots, I have a vampire tot. Doesn't quite look like Barnabas Collins, more Dracula, but yeah, you know, it still fits. And I do have a red gem that I just haven't put on him yet. Um, I did want to make a truly Barnabas Collins tot though. I just ran out of time. But I do have a gem that looks a lot like the um, necklace he wears most of the film. So um, here's a picture of it. So I have something that kind of looks like that. I also almost crocheted an applique that looks like the gem, but I ran out of time. Also, we have a witch. So what does a witch need? A cauldron. This little cauldron is from this book. Highly recommend this book. I've done a review on this book. I can link it down below if you like. Great, great beginner book. If you've never made amigurumi in your life, this book is fantastic. But here is the little cauldron. Very easy, very simple. I made it pink because, yep. And next we have some bats because what do vampires turn into? Bats. These are a tutorial by Crimson and Wool. I will link her tutorial down below super fast, easy little things. Turn them into keychains, they'll be a big hit at any craft fair. But if tiny is more your thing, Club Crochet has this little guy. I meant to turn him into a hairpin, but 
I just forgot to glue him to the hairpin, so he's still just a little, little bad. I had this on my list to make during Halloween anyway, and then when I realized I was gonna do dark shadows, I went, perfect! If you have not seen this tutorial, don't worry, I will link it down below. This is one of the most fantastic things you can make this spooky season, honestly. It's a coffin coaster. <laughs> And I trimmed mine in red, like the inside of a coffin. So it's like a reverse coffin. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? I love it. I love it. I'm here for this. This, this is just, this is not my pattern. This is by, I believe, Nessa's Not. I will link the tutorial down below. You have to make one. You have to make one. These are so great and they're fast. Um, I almost made two, but then I was like, what am I gonna do with two? Part of me doesn't care, but <laughs> I love it. So um, you can choose your colors. I chose black because traditional, and then I trimmed it in this red sparkle because it kind of reminded me of like the inside of a coffin. Yep, highly recommend this. Okay. And then I went a little batty. <laughs> so I um, almost made this pattern by Five Little Monsters. I'm sorry, Erica. I ran out of time, but I still want to make him one day. He is so cute. Isn't he cute? Yeah, I will still link it down below. It's free, it's free on her blog, or you can buy the entire Halloween booklet on her Etsy shop. But oh, he is so cute. Didn't make him, oh well. But I did make mine. Have you seen my little boop? Yeah, he's a tutorial on YouTube. You can make him mm, under an hour. And um, I went a little batty and I made a bunch. <laughs> so you've seen Blip because Blip was the tutorial. And then I made this one. I just switched the wings. So you can sew them on this way where the side is flat like this, or you can sew them on the other way, just flip it around. And I like it better this way. Look, how cute is that? This is the new Big Twist variegated, I don't think, no, I don't have it. Um, I think this is called Happy Rainbow or something. I don't know. This is the slime green from Big Twist. But yeah, I'll put the name of whatever this yarn is down below. But anyway, isn't he cute? So, yeah. And then um, I made another... Blanca, where is Blanca? Well, Blanca is my white bat and she's missing apparently. So if I find her, I'll put a picture here. But anyway, I made another version of her. So here's this one. It doesn't have a face yet cause I can't decide what I want to do, so. And then I decided that a keychain version would be really cute. And so I made Boop 2.0. If you notice, his feet are different. Here is Boop 2.0. So his feet are a little different. That's kind of the only change. And I switched the wings to that pointy side. That's it. That's all I did. And I made a pink one because pink -oween. You will see these again but I can't tell you why. And then it's my channel. You know I had to. What did I make? A tot for the movie, of course. And who else would I make but Angelique in her signature stunning steal the show red dress. What do we think? How did I do? Really need to invest in a turntable. <laughs> I 
I love her. She is fantastic. I had to do this look over all the others because it's the red dress. It's on the posters. This is just where she steals the show. This, this dress is just fantastic. So that's everything I've made. Now, the rest of this video is going to be about the film. If you want to stay, awesome. If you don't want to stay, I completely understand. But thank you for staying for the crochet. I hope you liked it. Hello. Real quickly, I want to say, if you have small children watching with you, not that the images I show are scary, but this is not a film for kids. And some of the outfits that I'm going to show are a bit revealing. And uh, I just don't think that this video is quite appropriate for children under the age of 13. So do with that what you will, but I thought I would give you a quick warning. <laughs>
we were in the 1770s. So big time gap. Barnabas escapes. Angie doesn't know that yet. Yes, she is now Angie, still Bouchard, but she is Angie. And she is in this pantsuit. But look at her makeup, her hair, her suit. Her suit is pristine. Her hair is not a hair out of place. She even does this in the car, like no wrinkles. Cause she is perfect. Eva Green, the actress who plays Angie, was talking in an interview about how Angie is wearing a mask. Her clothes, her hair, her makeup, everything is a mask of how she actually feels, which I think is reflected in her clothing. So here she is wearing a very perfect pantsuit. Why? Predominantly man world, trying to fit in, wearing the feminine equivalent. However, you can tell she is embracing her femininity here, but to be taken seriously. And as she's driving through the town and waving and people are smiling, everybody's like, hi Angie and stuff, cause she's adored here. This is her Angel Bay, used to be Collinsport. When she finds out Barnabas has escaped, she changes outfits to go see him into this. I think this is very telling. First of all, she's wearing black and white still. Could just be, those are kind of semi-masculine colors cause they look like a suit. And she's wearing this really pretty white blouse, but look at the blouse. There are slight Victorian touches to it. And she wears a skirt with a huge slit in it, but the most fascinating piece of clothing, her jacket. Her jacket is fascinating because it has a really cute pop collar and it goes down, but it fans out like a cape, like a vampire cape. I find that very interesting that she wore a slightly Victorian blouse. Okay, the slit in the skirt, we all know why she did that. But, and then the, the, um, the jacket, like she knows exactly who she's going to meet and she dressed for the occasion. She didn't just dress to seduce him, she dressed to remind him. In fact, the moment where they actually have their first encounter is a really awesome scene. Highly recommend it. Anyway, the next time we see her is one of my favorite jackets. It is the blue velvet jacket. And um, side note here, she wears a few other versions of this shape, but not this, but not this color and not this fabric in a couple other scenes. But notice how her sharp, crisp lines in her clothing have softened. It might show her vulnerability. He's back, he can hurt her again. You gotta remember, a Angie is still someone with feelings. Very intense feelings, but they're there. And so I think it's very interesting how all of a sudden the lines have changed in her clothing from sharp, jagged edges to a more feminine, a little bit more sexy, and uh, rounder edges and stuff in her clothing. I think that's interesting, yeah, that's just me. So this outfit is really cool because look at her sleeves specifically. First of all, they kind of have the same velvet detail that mine do, but look at the inside of her sleeves, red. She is wearing this sapphire, I mean, in your face, sapphire, or as my mother likes to say, sapphire, <laughs> blue and these bright red ruby cuffs on the inside. Think about that. She is wearing velvet with a lining. What else has velvet with a lining in it? A coffin. This is not an accident. This is Colleen Atwood we're talking about. Not an accident. Okay. So she's having a meeting with a vampire and she wears that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's on purpose. Not to mention the dress underneath it is basically a slip. Yeah, she wears that. So take with that what you will. If something happens, moving on. So um, 
The next one we see here in is the red dress. And I think this dress is specifically passion. She is bright and notice no one else in the entire scene is wearing red. I, that was strategic. She is supposed to pop in the crowd and she does. No one else wears a color this bright. No one else wears red in this scene. She is there to stand out and she knows it. So she wears these really, you know, ornate earrings. She wears this, you know, incredibly low cut, slinky, sexy red dress. And it is in a jewel tone, a bright, sparkly, ruby red. I learned that lots of costume designers put actors in jewel tones that they needed to take control of the scene. So when she was in the sapphire blue, she was in control of that scene. We know that because she got what she wanted at the end of the scene. I won't spoil that for you. But in this one, she is in control. She is taking control of the room. Everybody notices her, but she won't notice them because she's not there for them. We notice her as an audience. She stands out among the crowd and she is in red, the color of love, lust, passion, and control. So we are watching her walk through the crowd. You know, she is taking control. So she dresses to seduce. And what does she see? Barnabas and Victoria with a moment between them. And it's enough to make her do that. Yeah. One more thing I wanna say about this dress. Look at the shape of this dress. Yes, it fits all of her curves and stuff, but it still reminds me of something. It's coffinish and it's red, a very popular color for coffin lining. Colleen doesn't do this by accident. This, this was on purpose. I'm telling you now, it was on purpose. So the very next outfit we see her in is her last outfit and her hair is now more curly. Her dress, I mean, it's a choice, but I think it's more reflective on what's going on inside her. It's disheveled. It's, it's got so many pieces. They're just like, they look like scraps flowing in the wind because she's falling apart. Looks like the dress is too. But inside she's falling apart because she knows she's losing and she has had it. She makes him one last proposal, me or the box. He chooses the box. And then she goes on a rampage to kill everyone. That's part of the Collins line. And anyone he loves, like Victoria. So, the very interesting thing we learn about Angie in the fight scene, specifically, is she is fragile both figuratively and literally, but I love what Tim Burton did here. He made her an actual porcelain doll. She cracks. She cracks. That is such a good metaphor for people who are this broken inside. They cannot cope. They cannot understand why people don't feel the same they do. That is obsessive love and it's dangerous, not just with magic. It's a very dangerous thing. And I love how Tim Burton made her actually crack and break. And uh, spoiler alert, okay? If you don't wanna know how she dies, she's the bad guy, she dies, okay? That's not a spoiler. But if you don't wanna know how she dies, skip ahead. She dies by taking out her heart, which her heart is so cool to look at. It is translucent. How telling is that? It is trans 
Lucent. Her heart is a translucent beating heart. It looks like it's encased in glass. And we find out it is glass. Barnabas says something and her heart shatters like glass. One of the coolest death scenes I think I've ever seen because it's so telling to her personality. It's so telling to her character. Her character is one of Tim's best written characters. And I cannot not give credit to Colleen Atwood and the hair and makeup team and Eva Green. She sold this. This was her first Tim Burton role. This was her first Tim Burton movie ever. And she nailed it. No wonder she's in lots of other Tim Burton stuff. He loves her. This, we do too, she's fantastic. You can come back now. <laughs> but anyway, that is my analysis of the character. Now the movie as a whole, I love it. It's funny, it's dark, dark comedy. Um, it's very Tim Burton, okay? It's very Tim Burton, but it's actually one of his tamer movies. Um, yeah, I actually think it's one of his tamer movies. I mean, there's some blood. Vampire, hello. He attacks people. Um, it's up to you if you want to see it. I, I give it an 8 out of 10. I think it's fantastic. But I also think that the character development is done really well. Now, this is not against Barnabas, but I did feel that this was a good movie to talk about this time of year because, you know, analysis of a villain kind of thing. And I thought that'd be kind of fun. Come back next week and we will do a very special edition of Tim Burton Tuesday. Not going to tell you what that means. You'll have to come back, but it is worth coming back for. Guarantee it. Thank you so much for being here today. If you watched this all the way through, I want you to write the word vampire somewhere in the comments section. Just lets me know how many people watch it all the way through. Remember, life happens, yarn helps, and Spoonies can stitch it up too. Bye.